Over 130 individuals will complete suicide each day in the United States alone. Welcome to Normalize the Conversation. I'm your host, Francesca Regeter, and today I'm joined by a peer educator in mental health, suicide prevention, harm reduction, and LGBTQ plus communities, the Director of Education at Hope for the Day, Allison Herman. In today's episode, we are learning about an incredible suicide prevention nonprofit, Hope for the Day. Join us as we dive into their use of outreach, education, and action to break the stigma and equip us with the right tools to be proactive in suicide prevention in our communities. Allison, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to chat with you and learn more about Hope for the Day. But before we begin, I really just want to check in with you. How are you really? Doing pretty good. Um, We are in the middle of Suicide Prevention Month, which is always an absolutely wild month. Um, But yeah, so far so good. Um, And we can talk about that a little bit later, but I'm in a pretty good spot. Um, I have learned a lot about myself in the past year and I have some pretty solid habits I'm really proud of. I love that. It's really great when you can reflect back on the past year and see growth. That's something I'm learning to do for myself because especially in this line of work, it can be so hard to hold on to hope sometimes. It can feel sometimes very, I guess heartbreaking is the word when we see the statistics, when the next year's statistics come out. So to constantly see growth within yourself and within the work you're doing is incredible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I feel like um, I tell my friends all the time that the work that I do actually gives me hope for humanity because I get to see the people that are both telling me really heavy stories, but also the people who really want to help their community and just make everything better. Um, And I feel like a lot of folks don't get to hear that side. They usually just hear the first side. Um, So it's really, it's really promising. And I love that. Oh my goodness. I love that too. I never thought about it that way. A lot of people do. I mean, you turn on the news and you get to hear the devastating stories, but Not everyone gets to hear the stories of hope and the work people are doing, which is why I love conversations like this. And I love the work that you're doing at Hope for the Day, because it really is creating conversations and creating a place where people can talk about it and actually start using actionable tools to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think one of the things that makes the work that I do with Hope for the Day really unique is that community piece. Um, We talk about it all the time that I feel like society does a a really solid job of trying to figure out how to get people to talk about their individual mental health and how they're taking care of themselves. Um, But I feel like when you start centering community and centering um, how we can do this together, it really creates something unique and different. And that's why I I work at Hope for the Day. It's like a really great approach to suicide prevention and having that conversation in a different way. Absolutely. Community is essential. I mean, it takes all of us. But on that note, can you tell us all a little bit more about Hope for the Day? Yeah. uh, Hope for the Day is a nonprofit movement empowering the conversation on mental health education and suicide prevention. Uh, We've been around since 2011. Um, we started on Warp Tour, which is something that I find really interesting to tell. I go into a lot of Chicago public schools and do mental health education. Um, and when I say that, they're like, oh, my gosh, that was back in the dark ages. Um, but it's really great to see how the org has grown um, from our humble beginnings in, in a music festival in 2011. But we go into workplaces. We go into schools, as I just mentioned, Um, And kind of wherever people want us to be to start a conversation on mental health and proactive suicide prevention, because we often don't see a lot of people having conversations about what kind of resources exist, what kind of community supports can I go to and check out. Um, And also, we're working on that local and national level. So we're based out of Chicago, but we go everywhere. Um, We had a team that was just in Birmingham, Alabama at Furnace Fest. Um, we are going to uh, Florida actually next week, I believe, um, for a dental conference. And yeah, we do a lot of different things. So it's really great that we get to be in all those different spaces and have this conversation. That is incredible. I mean, I absolutely admire that you're bringing the conversations to people everywhere. I wish growing up that 
in school I had those conversations. I grew up struggling so much with my mental health and all of these emotions that I didn't have the language to express to other people. And I didn't have the knowledge or information to understand that I needed support and there were things I could do. And if back then someone had had a conversation with me, if someone had talked about mental health, if someone was just there, it would have made such a huge impact. I believe it would have made such a huge impact on the trajectory of my mental health journey. It is so incredibly important that we have these conversations and we start it at a young age. Yeah. Um, hope for the day we do a lot of our educations if you're 12 or older. And if you haven't been in school in a while, that's seventh grade. Um, so I love talking to our seventh and eighth graders. Um, and it's exactly what you said. Like that is around a time where people are starting to go through a lot of changes, both in their own bodies, but also in school. Like I didn't realize because I grew up in a really small place that a lot of city schools, um, you have to like apply to high school. There's a lot of pressure um, or you have a lot of different responsibilities happening in that city center. So um, giving people tools, one of the coolest things that we've added to our uh, school educations this year is we have like a healing and management worksheet that we give them halfway through the presentation. So that's just going over like, hey, when you feel this way, what are some coping skills that you have? Are you keeping up with regular levels of sleep, eating, exercise? Are you checking on yourself? Like, I agree. I I also didn't have those tools growing up. And I really would have loved if someone had like even hinted at those are options that I could just like kind of have a roadmap of things that I could check on just to see where I was at during the day. That is incredible. I mean, bridging that gap in communication of I'm feeling this, this is what I can do for it is so important because I remember the first time I heard about coping skills, I didn't understand what that was or when to use them. And I didn't understand that you could plan to use them. I was kind of taught it in a very reactive way. So thinking about if I was 12 years old, 13 years old, and someone told me, when you're feeling overwhelmed, what's something you could do? And I learned that I could go for a walk. I could take some deep breaths. I can maybe blast Taylor Swift and have a dance party. That there were things that I could do to manage that emotion, to move through it, to not feel stuck in it and allow it to kind of make me feel like I'm crumbling. That would have changed everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I also remember, um, because the mental health piece is super important, but I remember when um, folks would die by suicide in my childhood, I remember it, it, I believe the first time it probably happened was in high school. Um, And all of the adults were so awkward and didn't know how to talk about it. And it, it kind of got brushed under the rug. And you're right, a lot of our stuff is very reactively focused, and we don't give people proactive tools early, um, just to like, navigate those discussions, but also to just kind of know what to look for, how to help someone, how to have those conversations. Um, and I, I really do feel like the conversations that we're having in these community spaces, but also in schools is like, really going to change the world. And I, I know that sounds really cheesy, but like, I really start seeing how our work is impacting other people as soon as we leave the building. Um, the administrators will message us and be like, oh my gosh, that was so great. Thank you so much for being here because not everybody has an adult in their life who is um, friendly and supportive or even knows where to start because some of these conversations are so taboo in certain discussions in certain communities. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, like I said, really proud of the work that we do and I'm so glad I get to do it. It will absolutely change the world. I mean, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was writing a blog about how, I guess, awkward and uncomfortable a lot of times adults can be when they hear about suicide and they're talking about it because they were never taught what to say or how to respond. And it was so taboo for so long. I mean, it's only in the recent, I don't know exactly how long, but I want to say about decade that it's become more of a conversation that people are willing to not shy away from the word, the word, but instead talk about it. So the other day, someone, I don't know like how they found out that I had attempted, but they came up to me and they're like, is it true that you tried to kill yourself? How could you do that? Why would you do that? You're this, you're that. And just, they got so uncomfortable and they were panicking and I was comforting them. And I was like, wow, 
this person genuinely has never had a conversation like this before. They don't know what to say and it's overwhelming to them. And I wish that there was a space for them to hear about it, to learn, to hear people's stories, to learn what they can say, learn what they can do to be part of a solution, which is why these community outreach events going beyond the school system, but going into the workplace, going out into the community can make such a huge impact because although it's so great to start it at a young age, I'm very, 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 very big advocate for that. It is so important that the people listening and responding to our youth also have the tools to be able to respond and be there and also get support when they need it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that. Because yeah, I feel like one of the biggest things is the work that we do educating adults. Um, I have to switch up my presentation a little bit because as you just kind of illustrated, they don't know what to say. They don't know what supports are out there. And I find that a lot of folks who are in Gen Z or younger already have like a good handle on um just the ability to have these conversations a little bit more easily. But yeah, when I go into workplaces, when we go to outreaches and festivals and community spaces, um, sometimes I, I started tabling back in 2018. Um, and I love tabling because it's one of the best ways to really get in front of people and see what they want to talk about. And sometimes people just want to talk to another person and, and then walk away, um, especially someone who this is the work I do every day. Um, I have a pretty good handle on how to have these discussions. And sometimes people just really want to ask questions and talk and maybe vent. Um, and I, I love that aspect of tabling because it gives people a chance to just ask those questions in a way where maybe that person um, gets to be a little bit more curious in a way that's safe. And I find that really helpful because yeah, it is really interesting just the things we all miss growing up and then the things we continue to miss in adulthood. Like I didn't go to therapy until, wow, uh, well into my young adult life. So it was post-college. So I was in my late twenties and I was like, well, I, I suppose I could, I could go to therapy for real. Um, but part of it was because I just didn't have the supports around me to urge me in that, like kind of shift me in that direction so that I, could do that confidently. And I feel like that's where a lot of people sit. Um, the pandemic certainly helped with realizing that mental health is a thing and being overwhelmed is a thing. And a lot of people have learned a lot from that experience, but I still feel like there's a lot of work to be done. And that's why we go out there and do it. I agree. I think the pandemic really opened up people's eyes to want to be part of a conversation and understand that we all have a range of emotions as humans and it's okay to feel upset. But if you are feeling extremely upset to where it's impacting your social life, your occupation, your schoolwork, where it is lasting for many, many days, two weeks or more, that you don't have to stay feeling this way, that there's support out there, that other people are also going through this. And there's things you can do. And I think that social media really, really did a great job in normalizing the fact that there's mental health symptoms, mental health conditions, and there's support out there, whether it's through organizations like Hope for the Day, whether it's through resources, therapy, medication, supplements. I think we saw a big push in there's things out there for you if you're willing to reach out. And if you know where to look, that's another big thing is a lot of people just don't know where to look. Yeah, I think um, I just looked at our data, but I think about 80% of the people who take our educations in whatever form that happens don't know about all the hotlines that are on the back of the resource cards that we um basically pass out. And that's at community events, schools, every place that we go. Um, but they have things like 988 or the crisis text line um, or Trevor Project or all of these additional lines that I feel like a lot of folks feel like there are not that many resources. But once you start um, really looking out, looking for things, it it is surprisingly plentiful. 
Um, and that's one of the things that Hope for the Day does really well. We have a resource compass where you can put in any U.S. zip code for a variety of services, whether that's I'm looking for a dentist or I'm looking for childcare or legal assistance or food. Um, and it works all over the U.S., which I think is really powerful. Um, and you just have to go to hftd.org slash find dash help and put in a zip code. Um, it's a really cool resource, but yeah, exactly what you said. A lot of people don't know what's out there. And when you're in a place where you are really struggling to be a person, that is not the right time to go on a Google search, right? Yeah. Um, so I like that that already exists for people just to turn to and be like, okay, let's figure that out. Um, because suicide prevention is about a lot more than just talking to someone. It's also having all of those basics met. Absolutely. And I did not know about that resource finder, but that is incredible because like we said, a lot of people don't know where to go or they hear about things, but they don't know where in their local area. That's another big thing. I hear about things in different states. I'm like, oh, I wish that was in Florida. It might actually be. I just don't know where it is. So having a space where you can type in your zip code and find what's near you is huge. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, a lot of people don't realize that um, even some of those national hotlines are centralized. So um, I always have my interns or my uh, instructors call hotlines every once in a while. One, just to talk about the fact that we know what we're doing, but also because some of the hotlines, for example, 988 is regional. So you call the national 988 number, and then it will route you to a number that your um, cell phone area code is. Uh, so I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. Um, so that is usually the call center I get sent to versus one of my interns grew up in St. Louis. So she will get a different experience because you're going to a different call center because of the way that's not centralized. So I think that also helps people kind of understand and navigate all of these different experiences that folks are reporting on because you're right, the experience in Florida is very different than the experience in Chicago. Um, but if you move away from home and you keep the same cell phone number, sometimes your experience goes back to what you what you used to see. So it's really interesting the way some of these supports are set up. And I just am a huge advocate of giving people as much information as possible so that they can be successful and know how to advocate for themselves. Absolutely, giving people as much information as possible is one of the biggest steps we can take because with information comes the ability to take the first step. A lot of times people just don't know where to start. They don't have any information to make that first step, but by gathering some information, by hearing stories, by hearing resources, by having a conversation, it can be the difference in someone struggling in silence and alone to reaching out for support and getting the help that they've needed for a long time. I'm really curious, what inspired you to get involved with Hope for the Day? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I So I did 10 years in marketing and advertising before I switched to nonprofit. And um, my marketing director absolutely loves this story because it's just so perfect. Um, so basically, I was in the marketing world, going upstairs, getting my free soda at the ad agency that I worked at. Um, and in the town hall space, there was this presentation about things we don't say. And I wandered over and I'm like, what's going on here? And it was hope for the day. Hope for the day had come into my workspace. Um, they were giving a presentation about uh, mental health, escalation, how to help someone in crisis. And they also were saying it in a very um, practical way that felt way less clinical than things I had seen before. And I was like, okay, this seems cool. And what's really interesting for me is that I approached that presentation being like, I'm here to get information for someone else. Like I know someone else in my life that's having a tough time. I really want to hear this information. Let's figure this out. And then from there, I started volunteering. Um, and then from there, I just kind of stuck around until I got involved in some projects. And then in May of 2021, I became the director of education. So um, it's been really interesting to see the evolution of the organization. Um, and also just, I was excited about seeing other people who really cared about community support. We're using really simple terms, free of jargon, and just 
trying to figure out the best way to connect everyone and have these conversations in an easier way. Um, something else that opened around the time that I joined Hope for the Day as a volunteer uh, is Sip of Hope, which is our coffee shop in the Logan Square community, where 100% of the proceeds go to all the work that I do now, um, which is really, really cool. And I think the thing that I was always looking for for community was finding people who were a lot like me. Um, I know we're doing a podcast, but I have a lot of tattoos. Um, I'm a really big fan of pop punk music. And this, the origins of Hope for the Day have a lot of chemical romance. Uh, people who are just very excited about music and community and looking for someone who just wants to have a conversation like a person. Um, I I had looked at a lot of other nonprofits and everybody's doing their own thing and really great, but I hadn't found a place that really felt like me. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, plus, I'm I'm someone who wears all black all the time, and <laughs> Hope for the Day's branding kind of kind of swings that way as well. So it just felt like a good fit, um, and especially with the way that my uh, marketing and advertising world was shifting dramatically during the pandemic, I just felt like it was the right time to really commit and move over to Hope for the Day. Your story is just like the shows the impact of Hope for the Day's work and bringing a conversation into the workplace and how much that can change everything for someone. It inspired you to get more information, to volunteer, and now actually get to really be part of the work that's happening. That's incredible. Yeah, thank you. I I mean, I also, because of the information I learned at Hope for the Day, I was able to go into therapy with a lot of information about like how to get there, how to find the right person. Um, I also ended up going into EMDR eventually, which is a type of therapy that was very much needed for me to have a better quality of life. Um, and one of the biggest things too, is when you have people in your space who are talking about mental health in a positive way, who are not afraid to have conversations about suicidality, it also empowers you to find resources and get more assistance. Because I remember before I saw that presentation in that community space, um, I just felt kind of funky a lot of the time and I didn't really think much of it. But once I was in a community of people where, where they were talking about it and I was learning how to teach our educations and I was seeing a lot of people tabling at concerts, having basically the same conversation over and over again, just like people are looking for someone to have conversations about mental health. Let's figure it out. Let's like talk about where resources are. Um, you almost can't not you know, improve your own mental health, which I think is really like powerful. Um, a lot of my friends who are not in this field, again, asked me like, Hey, why are you still doing this? That sounds really dark. Kind of the beginning of this conversation that we had. And I'm like, no, it gives me hope that people want to make the world better. And I think that that also is really cool to see people build community and um, not shying away from the things that make folks uncomfortable because that's where you see a lot of growth is when you really accept that discomfort and figure out what we need to do to move forward. Yes. I mean, that community piece is essential. Finding, like you said, a place where you fit in, where you belong and a space where you can talk about it, where you don't have to shy away from it. You don't have to dance around the subject or walk on eggshells to talk about it. You can genuinely have an honest and vulnerable conversation can ask questions, you can learn and grow together. That is huge because otherwise it really is so many people struggling in silence, afraid to talk about it, feeling like no one will understand and there's no place for them to go. Yeah. And that's something we talk about a lot. Um, we have several different types of programs, depending on what community we're going into. And when I talk uh, for a workplace community, so I'm going in, we're talking about, um, just the stigmas that exist in a lot of spaces. And that's something we talk about in workplace a lot, where like, if you talk about your mental health or you're having um, a tricky day or things are just kind of challenging, sometimes people shy away from you. Um, so that community piece of like making sure a lot of people are on board and understanding. We also talk about um, in our educations, like how to be supportive. One of the last things we talk about is being on the same team. Um, so we're not here to fix people or save people. We're here to make sure that we're on the same team moving towards a goal, which is 
you know, somebody having a better day. And I think that reset is also really, really valuable um, to make this conversation easier because when you feel like you have to have all the answers and you're really nervous about what you're going to say, sometimes that stops people from connecting. Um, but when you're on the same team, uh, everybody's bringing something different to the team and you know that you have a network of support and it's not just you against the entire world. Like you actually have like a little group of folks who want to help you out. And I, I really think that's powerful too. On the same team. That just really changed my own perspective because it's so easy to feel like you have to save everyone. I think in this line of work, at least for me, there's a lot of pressure to want to save everyone, to want to know exactly what to say and who to say it to, and trying to realize that it's okay to not know. It's okay to refer someone to resources. You don't have to know exactly what to say and be able to fix it for them. You don't have to fix things for other people, just providing support, being there, listening, giving them a space to talk, to share, being there while they maybe call a hotline number or they look up a resource, just physically being there, emotionally supporting them is a huge, huge step and it is saving a life, but you don't have to physically do all the saving and fix every single thing for someone. Just being there and knowing that other people are going to be there too is just huge. Yeah, and we're all different. And I feel like when we start recentering the conversation where people are asking like, hey, what does support look like for you? What do you need? Um, what can I do to, to help you out? That also helps the other person um, feel like they don't have to have all the answers, but also that you're going to listen. Um I know for a long time I didn't open up because I was worried that somebody wasn't going to listen and they were just going to do what they thought was right. And that doesn't feel very good either. Um, so again, trying to figure out how to listen, don't be judgy, um, make sure that you're centering the person who needs assistance, not um, not directing somebody in a direction that doesn't feel right for their circumstances and just bridging people to resources that make sense. Um, something we've been talking about a lot recently with the way that the world is currently looking is not every resource works for everyone. And knowing that some people need a resource that maybe is in Spanish versus English, or if you're if you're LGBT plus, you want to make sure your therapist gets you so you don't spend the entire session explaining who you are. Um, and those little pieces, again, it comes from understanding the person that you're talking to instead of just having all the answers, you're, you're working together. Yes, it's so important to understand who the other person is and what they need and if you don't know it's okay to ask how can I support you what can I do to be here for you it's okay to ask I think for a long time at least I felt that you had to have all the answers going back to what we said before and it's okay to not know it's okay to ask what does support look like for you just like you said because the support I need and the support you need may be completely different or they could be very similar, but we won't know if we don't ask each other and listen. We have to have the intent to listen. I think a lot of times I've noticed for me is people will ask me questions and they want to help and they'll go straight to asking more and more and more questions and never give me a chance to respond. And the most important thing, in my opinion, that we can do is listen so that we can offer support that's right for them because again i might have the answers for me i might not but i might have some of the answers for me but those might not be the answers for you and that's okay but i won't know if i don't listen yeah absolutely um i remember one of the things we talk about um in our lgbt presentation that is like a a subset of the the main presentation that we discuss is talking about those specific things that people are looking for um, like talking about pronouns, preferred names, um, things like that in spaces where you're going into crisis care and sometimes folks are not used to accommodating discussions like that and they're kind of just go, go, going. Um, and something that I always like to tell people is I put on my chart when I went in um, for a medical experience, but not a mental health medical experience. But I went when I went into the hospital last, um, I put on my chart, like, please don't touch me unless it is medically necessary, because I know a lot of nurses who are super well intended will do that, like shoulder touch um, for comfort. And that just makes my anxiety a lot worse. So 
uh, that was huge to like know the tools that you can actually implement in that hospital setting, having that conversation, knowing what that person needs um, every time they come into the room and look at your chart is also like a huge tip just to give people um, agency about all of those experiences. But I know that because somebody else told me I could do that. <laughs> it wasn't something that I just had every time I was like, oh, if you have to go into a hospital or have to go into an inpatient, um, it's it's really interesting. And it's not just for folks who are going in for mental health concerns, it's for folks who maybe have a surgery or um, are having like a check-in with their doctor. You can put anything you want on your chart and they have to look at it every time they talk to you. So I find that to be like a really great shortcut when you're trying to advocate and sometimes it feels really exhausting. Okay. I did not know that you could do that. And I love that you shared that because I don't like most physical touch it makes my skin feel like it's crawling I don't know why I just for me it's not always very comforting depends on who the person is I don't like when a stranger just puts their hand on me and I had no idea that I could put in a chart to say like please don't touch me unless it's medically necessary because that can increase my anxiety and make me feel very agitated uncomfortable and worsen the symptoms of what I'm experiencing but that's true in everything we're doing. We're allowed to set boundaries. We're allowed to say, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Please don't do this. And I didn't learn about boundaries until maybe a year ago to be able to say, no, this isn't for me. Please stop. Or I'm not comfortable with this. I'm going to do something else. I didn't know that boundaries were a thing. I didn't know that you can make a request and speak up for yourself to protect your physical or mental space. And that's something that's so important. Yeah, I'm glad that you found that. I, I love a good boundary. It's my favorite. Um, And I really like the ability to set boundaries for yourself, but also set boundaries for um, relationships. Uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is because we're not here to fix or save anyone, um, you're allowed to tell someone like, hey, I'm recording a podcast right now and I'll be available in like an hour instead of just picking up your phone every time it rings, right? Um, and I think that is, again, very helpful for people to have a lot of agency and control over how they're moving through the world. Um, and you don't have to say yes to everything. And you don't also don't have to be available 24-7. That's just an unrealistic standard. Um, but I'm glad you found that because, yeah, boundaries boundaries are great. And it also makes you feel like you're in charge of your own life, which I really enjoy. I mean, absolutely. You do not have to be available 24-7 and you should feel like you are in charge of your life and feel comfortable and safe in every space that you're in. You deserve that. And I think for so long, so many people felt like they didn't, they shouldn't feel safe sometimes or that it's okay to not feel safe, that you have to make everyone else comfortable. And that's not true. You should also feel comfortable and safe. And there's a difference between a little bit of discomfort in the sense of having a conversation to grow and discomfort in this is not safe, this is bad for me, I don't like this, I'm uncomfortable, and I want out of this situation. And I think that without conversations like this, people don't know that there's a difference. Yeah, and I, I think, like I said, we talk about something called um, baseline in our educations, which is a, it is a clinical term, but we define it every time we bring it up, which is basically um, one of my, uh, one of the folks who does work with me, uh, she calls it the, like a, a random Tuesday where you're just you moving through the world and everyone's baseline is different. Um, and Sometimes folks are moving through the world in a very different way that feels really comfortable to them, but we're all very individual people. Um, and there's not just one script for everyone. So I feel like that's a really good thing to remember too. Like, what's your own individual baseline? What are you looking for on a day-to-day -day basis? And then what's the baseline of the people around you? And the way that we use that tool when we talk about mental health is we talk about the fact that um, life is stressful and sometimes uh, you are moving outside of your baseline and you're starting to escalate up this curve of difficulty. And oftentimes we don't realize that we're getting close to crisis because we haven't been trained to realize that we're moving away from our baseline so significantly, um, which is why it's really powerful to know yourself, really know what's standard for you. And then you can start realizing what's standard for other people in your life. But yeah, I went from zero to 60 over and over and over again, 
um, because I was not trained to notice that escalation that was happening inside my own body or inside my own brain, um, because it's just not always something that's taught to us uh, at various points in life. It really isn't taught to us, and it's so important to understand where your baseline is and what's impacting you. I am so amazed by all of these different pieces of the education that comes with Hope for the Day. What else do people get to learn from your presentations? Yeah, uh, we have, like I've kind of hinted at in this conversation, so we have Things We Don't Say Part 1, um, which is our, like, our presentation that's been around for a long time. And it's what is baseline? What's escalation? What's crisis? Are you taking care of yourself? Um, what questions can you ask to help someone out um, when you're trying to be supportive? Uh, what does crisis look like? How do those hotlines work? And um, what are tools that already exist that you can rely on uh, either to help someone else or to help yourself? And then we also talk about stigma a lot in that presentation, which is always evolving. Um, even with a lot of the things that we've discussed here so far, you would never talk about them like 10, 20 years ago, but there's still a lot of stigma around different things like stigma around medication or stigma around different types um, of experiences that people are having. So uh, that's really interesting and helpful. And that's usually where we go into communities first is with things we don't say part one. Um, we also have part two, which was born out of a conversation where somebody was like, this was great. Allison told me all these things I need to be successful, but then I tried it and it was really hard. <laughs> so uh, part two is a workshop style experience where uh, you are learning how to active listen. And then we practice it as like a little group. We either do it on Zoom or in person, depending on where we're having that conversation. And you also get to practice um, talking to someone in crisis, which is really valuable because again, we're doing a mock style conversation. It's trauma informed. So you get to have that moment of practice in a space where nobody's in crisis, but you're practicing how to have those discussions. Um, so that's part two. And then we also have identity and orientation, which is for our LGBT plus folks, where we talk about specific stigmas, specific um, challenges in that community, and also specific things to know when you're trying to find a therapist who gets you or you may have to use a crisis response and what that looks like. And some of those tips and tricks that we've talked about already um, come up in there as well. And we have a lot of different presentations that uh, pop up here and there outside of those, but those are our main um, presentations. Uh, if you want to go to peervention.org, um, that is where a lot of our events show up. Um, but yeah, our biggest goal is to give people all the information that a lot of you are learning about in this conversation, but also there's a lot more. Um, we discuss things like what kind of supports already exist. If you have to call 911 at any point, how you have that conversation where they understand it's a mental health crisis. Um, and we also just really dig into all of the topics we've already discussed with a lot more specificity. Um, and especially if I'm going into a specific place, um, we're going to talk about like disability or FMLA, or if you're in your workplace, how do you have those conversations with your boss so that you can safely go where you need to go and take care of yourself? Um, and yeah, just trying to figure out how you can be the most impactful. Uh, we like to say that we really like to make sure we're starting the conversation where someone is, not where we want someone to be. So sometimes that's starting really basic and we're having conversations about what is a crisis stage? What falls under the word crisis? And sometimes we're having advanced conversations where we're discussing specific experiences. So um, I love adapting all of our educations to be what that community needs and then offering them additional supports if I can't uh, fulfill what they're looking for, because I think that's, again, um, really helpful. Our logo is a compass. <laughs> which is something I really enjoy telling people because we're here to point you in the right direction. We're not here to have all the answers. Um, so I really enjoy that experience of teaching folks, but also giving them additional resources to learn more. Okay. I love that about the logo. And I have to say there are so many mental health nonprofits and resources out there. But what I think is so unique for Hope for the Day is that it's not just what to look out for, but here's what you can do and how you can do it and giving people a space to practice supporting someone because it's so great to learn about it. It really is. But like you said, it's not always as easy to implement it. 
especially the first few times if you've never practiced. So giving a space for people to actually practice saying it when someone's not in crisis really helps them have the tools to support someone in crisis. And then the inclusivity, the LGBT plus presentation. It is so important that we provide more resources and support. I mean, I'm based in Florida and I can tell you that's not something that's always prioritized and it needs to be. So I am completely just amazed and in awe of the work that Hope for the Day is doing. Thank you. And yeah, different communities need different things. Um, We work with a lot of youth in Chicago, as I mentioned earlier, and there has been a, I believe the stat is a 37% increase in suicide in Black youth um, recently. And also for those LGBT plus folks, uh, folks who are LGBT plus of any age are two to six times more likely to attempt suicide than their straight peers. Um, So those communities especially need some extra support so that they are finding the help that actually helps them. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, when I was uh, helping build the identity and orientation presentation, the thing that came up a lot is, and I didn't realize this, is that a lot of therapists don't have to understand minority issues if they don't want to do that. Like their school doesn't always um, push that issue, which I didn't realize um, until I was like digging around and learning things. Um, But there's a really good list of questions on our website uh, for folks who are in those minority groups where you can just like ask questions like, hey, um, I'm this identity. Have you ever worked with anyone like me before? Or how do you think power and privilege really influences the way that you do therapy? Just again, asking those questions early. Um, I had a conversation with someone a while ago where they were like, well, what if I'm really honest with my therapist and they send me away somewhere? And I'm like, ask what their policy is. Um, you can ask all those questions up, up front so that you feel safe being open um, because there's nothing like sitting in a therapy session and being like, well, I want to be honest, but I don't know what they're going to say. Interview them up front. Why not? Um, you're probably paying for it anyway. So make it worth your while so that that person's a good fit for you. Yes, you're allowed to ask questions. You are allowed to ask questions and interview your therapist to make sure they are the right fit for you because not everyone is going to be the right fit for you. And that's okay. And that doesn't mean that therapy doesn't work for you. It doesn't mean that there is not help out there for you or that you don't deserve help. It's that not everyone is going to be the right fit and you deserve to find someone who is. So don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you don't know what questions to ask, reach out to organizations like Hope for the Day who can give you a starting point. Allison, you've been absolutely amazing today. As we're wrapping up, is there anything else you would like to share with us about Hope for the Day? Um, Yeah, let's see. Like I said, we do so much and we have such a a small but mighty team. Um, I think we've we've covered events. We covered education. Um, We also do a lot of outreach and fundraising. So um, we have a Chicago Marathon team. Um, We oftentimes work with breweries to figure out how we can best support people having conversations about mental health if they are in a brewery space, whether that's the employees or whether that's the um, folks who are drinking the beverages. Um, So that is something that we've done in the past and we partner with businesses um, where the conversation comes up a lot. Um, And we also just really love uh, having people reach out to us and say like, hey, we'd love to support you in this way. Does this fit with your brand and your experience? Um, Which I think is really helpful too, um, because everybody deserves to have this conversation, especially in spaces where maybe the conversations aren't being had. So please reach out or check out our stuff and uh, see where you fit in. Yes, everybody deserves to be part of the conversation. Can you share the website with everyone? Yeah, so it's hftd.org. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you want to find public free educations, you can go to peervention.org. And then um, on hftd.org, there's also a bunch of educational resources. So feel free to reach out, find all that information. Um, I hope you have a great time looking through the blogs, the data, all the things that we have to offer. Thank you so much for listening to Normalize the Conversation. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast is an initiative of Inspiring My Generation, focusing on normalizing the conversation, bringing education and awareness to the forefront, and amplifying global voices to spark change and hope. 
Inspiring My Generation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization on a mission towards suicide prevention through awareness, conversation, education, and support. Connect with us on Instagram at Inspiring My Generation and visit our website, inspiringmygeneration.org, to learn more about our work and how you can make a difference.